First of all, um, at the top you'll see a Crash Course YouTube video. Please watch that first. And then when you're done with um, humoral immunity, so you'll see what that is in just a minute. When you're done with humoral immunity, please watch it again. When we move on to cellular immunity, I'm going to have another video for you to watch. And again, please watch it at the beginning and then watch it when you're done with the, the cellular immunity PowerPoint. Just because repetition is key to learning, this is stuff that you've probably, unless you're in microbiology, you've probably never touched on this kind of stuff before. So, I want to just uh, stack, talk about what we did on the last PowerPoint, so Immunity A, we talked about how there is, you're born with certain defenses. Those defenses that you're born with are called innate defenses. So, you know, you have an innate sense that says, don't go into the dark alley. It doesn't feel right, okay? So, you just know better because you were born with that sense of what is normal and what is not normal. Okay, so this is something you're born with. So your primary defense, your first line of defense, is to keep the invaders out of your body. So that's going to be your skin and mucous membranes. Um, things like skin's acidity, um, having lysozymes. So you've got some lysozymes in your sebaceous glands. You've got some lysozymes in your um, tears. You've got mucus, you've got cilia that help catch things, things that are not supposed to go in there into your body. So let's say that somebody does end up, let's say you cut yourself, scrape your knee, whatever. Now you have breached your skin or your mucus membrane. Okay. Now you're going to move on still to innate defenses, but we're going to move on to the second line of defense. So the second line of defense is going to be um, some certain cells, like phagocytes, natural killer cells, and then, um, so the phagocytes, macrophages and neutrophils are the biggies, okay? Um, they're going to go and gobble up pathogens. Um, let's see, uh, natural killer cells, those guys are actually a really weird type of lymphocyte. Um, they are going to constantly patrol, very nonspecific. They just recognize if they see a cell that's missing, something's wrong with that cell's glycocalyx, which is actually, we're going to talk about that in this PowerPoint. Um, so if he passes by, if there is a cell that's been invaded by cancer, or if there is a, uh, or if it is a cancer cell, or if there is a cell that's been invaded by vi a virus, then that little marker that says you are you is gone. And the natural killer cell doesn't care what you are. You're just not supposed to be there. That's not part of you. So it pokes a hole in it and kills that cell. It doesn't matter. That cell is going to die anyway. Another innate response is inflammation. You get a boo-boo, you're going to have an inflammatory response. So what is the cardinal signs of inflammation? You're going to have some swelling, redness, heat, and pain. Perfect lecture question. Um, so how does that happen? Well, when you get a boo-boo, your body releases these chemicals, these inflammatory chemicals. And that's going to cause the vessels to dilate. That makes those capillaries more permeable. Then your uh, phagocytes can leave. Alas, some fluid's going to leave also because the gap got bigger. The mast cells released histamine, and that's going to make um, the vasodilation happen. And so you temporarily lose those gap junctions, I mean the tight junctions, desmosomes. So those cells can get out. Well, what's going to follow right behind those cells since there's a great big gap is some of the water from the plasma. So now the plasma has left the vessel, and so you get a little puffy around the boo-boo, right? Pretty simple. Um... That puffiness, that fluid, is going to push on nerve endings, and so you get some pain. Um, the vessels are dilated, so you get some heat. 
plus all the things that the, the cells are doing. They're doing an attacking. You have some other chemicals that are being released. For example, prostaglandin. Don't memorize that. But that also invokes an inflammatory response and pain and heat. So it's very complicated, but in a nutshell, swelling, redness, heat, pain, that's all signs of inflammation, which is a secondary innate defense. Okay, and then we have these cool proteins that are in our body. Um, many of them are actually in our blood. They're called complement. But then we also have some that are in our body cells, for example, interferon. And they're going to get activated to help um, break up that target cell, the cell that's been infected. And we're going to get we're going to get to that a little bit more. Um, complement is actually quite complicated, but just follow my PowerPoint and listen to my lead because there's a lot, there's a whole cascade, and we're not going to go through all the details of complement. Um, suffice it to say, complement shows up when bacteria shows up. Complement is an innate defense, but it sometimes will often actually will work with the adaptive line, so the third line that we're going to talk about today, um, because sometimes some cells will present to complement and say, look what I found. And those cells are going to be part of the adaptive response. And then finally, fever. Fever is going to fry systemically. It's going to kick up the heat. And when you increase heat, you increase the rate of reaction. And we're just going to try and cook out those viruses. All right, I told you it'd be a long slide. Okay, <laughs> so um, so that that's in a nutshell, a tiny little summary of the innate defenses. Not complete. Go back to your PowerPoint for complete list. So now we're going to move on to the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is much more specific. So a neutrophil is going to gobble up any bacteria. He doesn't care what the bacteria is. He's going to eat a bacteria. You're not supposed to be here. You're a bacteria. I'm going to eat you. A macrophage is going to go clean up mess. So, and clean up anything that the neutrophil missed. So, he doesn't care what bacteria it is. Um, fever. It doesn't care why you have a fever. Your body just creates a fever because it was told to create a fever. Your hypothalamus was told to create a fever. It doesn't care why. He got a signal, so he does it. Okay, adaptive immune system is very specific. So, um, in general, we're going to break it down into two different branches. One of them is going to be humoral immunity, and humoral immunity is going to be B cells. And then the other one is cellular immunity. That's going to be T cells. And some specifics about um, adaptive immunity besides the fact that it's, it's, it's going to a specific antigen, unlike the innate system, is it's going to go through your whole body. So that means it's systemic. He is not localizing on that tiny little boo-boo cut that you got. He is going to work throughout your whole body. You have an invader, and we need a full attack on something major. Okay? And then it creates armies, and some of that army is going to be a memory cell. So the purpose of that memory cell is so that if you meet that antigen again, boom, I can create a new army. So they're a, a small creation of the army. They're going to sit back and be kind of like the board of directors so that if you meet a certain thing again, and it's the exact same thing, that memory cell says, oh, I remember this, and makes an army to, to defeat it. That's true for both branches. However, they are different. Their, their um, end game is different. Human immunity is all about antibodies. Antibodies don't kill anything. Antibodies mark something for killing. So an antibody isn't going to do squat if you don't have cell-mediated immunity, if you don't have cellular immunity. You need those T cells to work in order to actually have a kill. But if they're not marked for death, then perhaps that cellular immunity isn't going to work as well. 
Now it's more complicated than that, obviously, or we wouldn't have so many PowerPoints on this chapter. All right, a 10 minute slide. Let's go for it. Okay, so humoral immunity, that guy um, is gonna be, again, that's gonna be B lymphocytes, and he um, makes antibodies. Now he has some antibodies bound to him, okay? But when he has been activated, when he has learned how to do his job and he meets somebody that is supposed to uh, trigger a response, he creates some new B lymphocytes that have a name called a plasma cell. And plasma cells throw out antibodies into the bloodstream. So they are freely floating around in body fluids. And I shouldn't even just say bloodstream because body fluids, humoral means fluid. It's also going to be in the lymph too. So it's not inside of a cell. It's freely floating outside of cells. Interstitial fluid. Any place that is not inside of a cell is floating around in. So what they're going to do is they're going to bind to the target. So you have this cell that's an infected that's infected with the flu. Okay? And you had your flu vaccine and it was a great flu vaccine year. <laughs> Those antibodies are going to go and grab a hold of the cell that's been infected with flu and deactivate it. And we'll get into different, that's complicated as well. There's different ways that antibodies can bind to it, but now he's marked to be destroyed. Okay, so um, we're going to have perhaps some phagocytes come along and destroy it, or complement if it's bacteria come along and destroy it. Or sometimes we might even have to call on the T cells. Cellular immunity are T cells that go against a target cell. They can, some of them, directly kill infected cells. Some of them help. So if they're just helping, they're going to release some of those cytokines that I talked about in the last um, PowerPoint. Just for example, there's lots of different kinds of cytokines. So a chemical that makes a response. So it's going to enhance that inflammatory response and it's going to activate maybe some other lymphocytes or call upon macrophages to come and do their job. Okay, I have to define an antigen. An antigen is a substance that tells the immune system, come over here, I need you. I need a B cell, I need a T cell. So it's going to... Um, create motion of the adaptive system. And by the way, sometimes I'll say adaptive and sometimes I'll say acquired. Remember, we've been through three books. They're the same thing, or I have, and sometimes I forget which one that this book uses. I believe that this book actually uses adaptive, but adaptive and acquired are the same thing. And Hank makes a point in the crash course to, to point that out as well. Okay, so... A complete antigen is large and it creates an immune response all by himself. We're going to develop an army against that guy all by himself. Um, he has these little uh, parts of him, a little marker on him, like a sight on him that stimulates the B cell to create an army. That's called an antigenic determinant. Okay, some antigens don't invoke a response all by themselves. Some antigens actually have to bind to your body in order for a response to happen. So I'm going to give you an example. Poison ivy. Poison ivy ha hanging out all by itself is not going to invoke a response. But what's going to happen is that poison ivy um, some of his molecules are going to bind to some of your body's proteins. And then your body goes, hey, you're not supposed to be here. And so then it actually invokes a response to create um, immunity. 
this page is probably too much in, in information, but I wanted to show you those antigenic determinants because this is picture worthy. Depending on the antigens, little um, antigenic determinants, you can see how they have different shapes. And this is very much simplifying it. But you have to create the correct antibody that links up with it like a lock and key mechanism. So when we say, okay, that antibody isn't going to do squat for that antigen, well, this is why. You have millions and maybe even billions of different kinds of antibodies that can be created. But it has to be specific to that antigen in order for it to work. And then, this is crazy, some antigens actually have multiple little um, antigenic determinants. So we've got, to, we've got to bind to each and every one of them in order for that antigen to be immobilized, in order for it to be non-destructive. So it's actually quite complicated, and that's why our adaptive immunity the B cells and T cells, they have to go to school. And then you've actually already met self antigens, so in the blood. So our cells are covered with stuff that makes us us. And so those self antigens are harmless to ourselves. Okay. There's one that I I'm going to tell you about called a major histocompatibility complex. And we all have on each of our nucleated cells, we all have a class one. I'm just going to say MHC now. Um, we all of our nucleated cells have an MHC. Okay. What determines our own personal MHC is our genes. So it's very individual and he has a groove that can hold another piece of self antigen or a foreign antigen. Okay, so all of our cells has this, or they should. And I mentioned in the innate system, that natural killer cell, if you're missing this MHC1, then he, should, he doesn't care. He's just going to destroy that cell. He doesn't know why. He doesn't analyze it. He just pokes a hole in it and kills it. Later, when we do cellular immunity, you're going to see that um, T, T lymphocytes get activated when they are presented with an antigen on an MHC protein. So he, if you're lacking in any of that, you can't get that T lymphocyte uh, to do his job. Okay, so three important cells, I've already mentioned two of them, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are humoral immunity, they're going to make antibodies. These guys, the B cells, they are working on pathogens that are floating around on the outside of the cells. And doesn't that make sense? Because I said antibodies aren't in the cell, they're in the humors, they're in the fluids, tissue fluid, blood, lymph, whatever. T lymphocytes, they're called cellular immunity because they go after pathogens that have made it inside the cell, like the flu. Okay, so that's two kinds of very important cells in uh, adaptive immunity. Here's another one. I've told you, uh, I've alluded to, some cells are going to bring pieces of the antigen. Those are called antigen-presenting cells. How perfect is that? They don't respond specifically or to a specific antigen. They recognize an antigen, and their job is to nom, 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 nom. They chew it up, and then they take a piece of that antigen, and they put it on their, their own MHC and say, looky what I got. They bring, they're going to bring it. They're going to present it to something, one of the cells. Okay. The antigen-presenting cells are going to be macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. Remember macrophages are more in the deeper tissues like connective tissues. Dendritic cells are going to be in epithelial type tissues. And then B cells. Remember I said B cells can't kill anything. B cells make antibodies which mark something for destruction. But B cells can't kill anything. 
But here's another thing that they can do, is they can present pieces of an antigen. Okay, so antigen presenting cells. Okay, so we've mentioned that lymphocytes have to learn how to do their job. Okay, well first, they're born, they're created. And you already know this from two, second week into AMP1, all of our formed elements in the blood are made in the bone marrow, in the red bone marrow. So red cells, white cells, platelets. Lymphocyte is a white cell. That's where he was made. Now they have to get matured in their primary lymph organ. And I mentioned this in the lymphatic system. B cells are going to get mature in the bone marrow, but not the T cells. The T cells are going to go get matured in the thymus. Okay, why do we have to get educated? Well, for a couple of reasons. We need to be able to, um, especially um, for the lymphocytes, we need to be very specific. So their job is to recognize a specific antigen. They have only one unique type of receptor on their surface so that when they are mature, they bind to one specific bad guy. And then the other thing is they have to learn self-tolerance. They have to be sure to not go crazy and attack themselves. So they need to meet self-antigens and they have to learn how to not attack self-antigens. They need to learn how to not respond to self. So that's, that's taught in their little school. Okay, so now let's say that they have learned how to do their job, but they have not been put to the test yet. When, that's, when that happens, they're called naive. They can do their job, but... It's their first day out. You just graduated from college. You got yourself a job, and you have no idea exactly what your first day is going to be like, but you know what you're supposed to do. Okay. So what's going to happen is they're going to go and set up house in some of those lymph organs that we already talked about. So lymph nodes, spleen, Consoles, they're going to hang out. I am ready to encounter an antigen. Okay, so they're going to set up house. Then those lymphocytes that have never had to work yet, they're going to have their first encounter. So let's do the tonsils. Okay, um, my daughters, I love to talk about how they put crickets in their mouth on their, you know, when they were crawling around. So, What's on a cricket head besides a cricket? I don't know. Crickets are crawling around on the ground. So there you go. Their tonsils met some sort of antigen. And of course, they were fine. But here we go. We're going to go ahead and stimulate those naive lymphocytes so that they can develop further and become an active cell if necessary. It's a pretty simplistic example, but you see what I mean. The tonsils are, especially the palatine tonsils, are constantly uh, bombarded by things. And then, let's say, let, let's do worse. Let's go ahead and go with the flu. So at your, your um, let's say your pharyngeal tonsils. The flu has made it past the mucus in your nose, made it past the little hairs in your nose, and he has made it to the pharyngeal tonsils. And so there we go. We have some lymphocytes hanging out in those tonsils. And they meet that flu virus and they create an army. So what was one lymphocyte now is hundreds or thousands of lymphocytes. Those guys are effector cells to fight infection. So, you know, most people don't actually die of the flu. They die of secondary complications to the flu. Young people, senior citizens, um, they'll end up getting a secondary pneumonia that the virus caused. So it could be a viral pneumonia, but it could also be a bacterial pneumonia where um, their immune system was beaten down and they got a secondary bacterial infection, which is 
totally different from a viral infection. And then they succumb to, to the pneumonia. Okay. Um, the effector cells, we'll talk about them. They get different names, and I already alluded to the humoral plasma cell, but cellular immunity, the T cells, um, they have a couple of extra guys. But I did allude to this. Those armies, although they make a whole army of, of fighters, the fighters are going to be called effector cells. Some of those guys that are created are also going to be memory, memory cells. So they're going to hang out and they're going to be waiting for the next time the body gets invaded. So the second time the body gets invaded, then they can make an army. But for the initial... For the initial insult, they just hang back and let the effectors do the job. Once you've created those armies, they're circulating in the in the bloodstream, in the lymph, wherever. Um, so this is actually just a summary of everything I said. It's very pretty pictures, and please feel free to look through this at your own leisure. Okay. So I've mentioned this already, and Hank gets into this a little bit too, but how our genes determine what our body can recognize. So here we go with this coronavirus. This was an animal virus. Our genes have no idea what to do with this. None of our B cells that have been to B cell school have the genes to fight this virus. There is no... There is no, um, there's no antibody with the antigenic determinant for coronavirus. But look at this. We've got 25,000 different gene codes, and they get shuffled, which allows that, that guy to have billions of different types of antigen receptors. So, I mean, our body. So our body could defeat billions of different kinds of antigens. T cells. T cells are, like I said, they're going to mature in the thymus. And then not only do they have to learn how to recognize, okay, you're a bad guy and I'm going to kill you. Oh, you're a good guy. I am not going to kill you. They even have testing. And if they flop their testing, they just get destroyed. So um, this happens a ton at um, between birth and about two years old. One year old is when our thymus is really working super, super, super hard. So positive selection is when we're having um, T cells that are learning to say, oh, hey, I know you. You're okay. You're, you're part of me. I won't hurt you. Negative selection is when we have destruction of those T cells that did attack a self cell. So all of this stuff is going on inside the thymus, these tests, um, and a large percentage of them actually get killed. This is a cool picture from a different book. This is from the McKinley book, McGraw-Hill, and I think it's, it's um, the pictures in that book are really quite amazing. But this is showing, okay, so, here is a, a pre-lymphocyte. Here's a pre-lymphocyte. Here is um, one of our cells. They're actually, the book goes into the detail about how we have some epithelial cells. And they're going to go to these pre-lymphocytes and say, Woohoo, here we go. You are um, supposed to recognize that I am you. And if he recognizes it, then he gets to then he gets to live. If he um, recognizes uh, that it is not self, and um, he attacks it, then he gets to live. If these guys attack self or don't attack. Uh, a antigen, and they don't get to make it. So only 2% actually get to leave the thymus and go hang out in a lymphoid organ. 
So pretty rigorous. That's like West Point. Rigorous testing there. There's something else that comes to mind. Um, when we get into the um, cellular immunity, some of these lymphocytes are going to be called um, helper cells, and they have a protein called CD4. And then some of them are going to be called cytotoxic T cells, and those have a CD8 protein, and that will come up again, but repetition is key learning. So here we go. These are those guys. They're still naive. They still have to go out into the real world to a lymphoid organ and meet an antigen to, to be able to be a worker bee, but um, uh, they are, they've been to school and they have the knowledge of how to do it. So now I'm going to go through those antigen presenting cells. These are the guys that are going to grab a hold of that antigen and pick off a piece of the antigen and put it on top of one of their MHCs. And again, dendritic cells are in the epithelium. Macrophages are really more patro patrolling in the connective tissue in the deeper areas and then the B cells. Dendritic cells, what they're going to do is they're going to enter the lymphatics um, and present to a T cell in a lymph node. These guys are actually super, super effective. They're the best antigen pre preventer, and they are a perfect link between um, what we're born with and activating the adaptive system. Here's a picture of them. They they look like they have dendrites right here. But they do, they destroy that antigen, but they're not a true macrophage in that their job isn't to go and gobble, 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 a whole mess of things. They grab a hold of one problem, one antigen, and then take it into a lymph node. Macrophages do do all that gobbling, but if there's a recognition that we need to take it further past the innate system, then they're going to grab a hold of that guy and um, they're going to put it on one of their MHCs and they're going to bring it to a lymph node. Now, one thing that macrophages can do is they present to T cells, but also they can put out cytokines that will activate more macrophages. So a, a, a positive feedback kind of thing, if you will, that where he just kind of shouts out, hey, I got one, and he gets more acro macrophages to come along and start eating up more of whatever is there. So he is al he's alerting the innates, so alerting more macrophages, but he also is going to go and present it to the adaptive system so we can have a really strong response on both parts, innate and adaptive. Um, a B lymphocyte, he is going to grab a hold of that antigen and he's going to bring it to one of the CD4, um, so a helper T cell, he's going to bring it to a CD4 protein. So he takes that little gobbled up piece and he shows a helper T cell. And then what's going to happen is then that B cell gets activated so that he can make those antibodies. When he is activated, he clones, but his new clones are going to be called plasma cells. That's called the humoral response. So here we go. He gobbles up an antigen. He takes a piece of that antigen. He puts it on one of his MHCs, and he takes it to a, a T helper cell so that the B cell can get activated. When he gets activated, then he can make his plasma cells. He can make his armies. And then instantly, we're going to make some antibodies. Now, the first time this happens, there's a lag in the response. But the second time is going to be a quicker response. We'll get into that later, but it makes sense as to, let me explain why you get two vaccinations. The first vaccine, like so whatever, measles, for example, um, hepatitis. The first vaccination, it takes uh, 10 to 14 days to mount an immune response. 
the second vaccination, you've already got that initial response and you've got some armies out there. The second vaccination, you're going to have a rapid, in 24 hours, uh, a new army created. Those poor plasma cells, though, they, uh, although they spit out a lot of antibodies, um, he doesn't have a very long life. The antibodies do. The antibodies, some of them can live 30, 40, 50, 60 years, but the poor little um, plasma cell, he's got a short life. He's going to pass away. And then I've mentioned this already. Some of those army cells, so some of the clones, they don't become the plasma cells that make antibodies. Some of them become memory cells. And that way, the next time you meet it, immediately you're going to have a new response of a huge amount of antibodies right away. <laughs> I don't remember why I drew those eyes there. Um, okay, distracted. All right, so here we go. We have a B lymphocyte. He's been to school. He went to the bone marrow, and he has these little antigenic determinants sticking off of him. So these are bound antibodies on this B lymphocyte so that he can recognize antigen. So here comes those antigens, and they uh, attach to the antigenic determinants on that B lymphocyte, B lymphocyte. Okay. He is going to take that antigen. I don't know if you can see my marker. He's going to take it and he's going to bring it to a helper cell, a helper T. Now, again, we'll get into them later because they have their own little set of um, things that they, they got to go through too. But he's going to release some cytokines. In this particular case, it's interleukin-4. Don't memorize that. Okay. He's going to sprinkle that B lymphocyte with some cytokines to activate that B lymphocyte. So he grabbed a hold of an antigen. He presented it to a helper cell. The helper cell releases some cytokines, some chemicals, so that now that um, B lymphocyte can create an army. Most of them are going to be plasma cells down here at the bottom. So they're kind of funny looking on this picture, but I tell you on a, on a cytology slide, they are beautiful. They are, they're huge, um, a huge nucleus, just like the lymphocytes always have. But even their cytoplasm takes on a bluish hue, and they're blue because they're loaded with rough ER, um, because they got to make all these proteins. These antibodies are proteins. And if you probably remember, maybe I told you an AMP1. If you can't remember if it's a, a carb or a lipid or a protein, if you just flat don't know, just say protein because most things are proteins. Okay. Anyway, um, they have a cool little clear zone too, by the way, by their nucleus. And um, that's a Golgi body. It's just, they're beautiful. Okay, and then some in the army, not very many of them, but some of them are going to remain as memory cells for the next time that antigen comes to the body. So this is just an overall chart. Um, B lymphocytes are called humoral because they're attacking outside of the cell. T lymphocytes are actually going to go after um, an antigen that has made it into a cell. B lymphocytes make antibodies. The antibodies mark things for destruction, but they don't kill anything. T lymphocytes, some of them will kill, not all of them. Um, let's see, they both originate in the bone marrow, but their maturation is in different places. So B cells are going to mature in the bone marrow, but the T cells are going to mature in the thymus. Once we have created an army, we're going to have a different name for the B lymphocytes. It's going to be plasma cells, and they make memory cells also. T lymphocytes, we haven't gotten into those, but repetition is key to learning. Here's some names. Cytotoxic T cells, helper T cells, regulatory T cells, and then neither of these actually list 
memory cells, but memory cells are also made in the creation of the armies. So here's a little cool picture down there at the, well, on the right hand side of these graphs, there's a memory cell on both of them. So that primary response, like I said, you know, initially, the first time they meet something, so they've been to school, they know how to work, but the first time they meet something actually and are put to work and they make that army, that peak level of uh, response is going to be about 10 to 14 days, okay? The second time is when we're going to get a huge response. It's going to be within 24 hours usually, and you're going to have lots of long-lived antibodies. Depends on what it is. It also, of course, depends on what it's attacking. You know, the flu changes all the time. The reason that we're in seclusion right now for the coronavirus, this guy can change rapidly. The more people he meets, the quicker he can change. If he changes real fast, we're not going to be able to get a vaccine on this guy. So uh, there you go. It's a little perfect, apropos time to be studying immunology. Although, honestly, we're just going to be barely touching the surface. So, so here we go. Human response. When you get a vaccine, you're making antibodies. That's the best example that I could, I could give you. So the first time you get a vaccine, your greatest response is by your textbook, 10 days. Okay. And it's all going to go down. It, it might hit zero. It might not hit zero. But if you hit, if you expose it a second time, look at the difference in response on that antibody. Um, I think I've mentioned before how you do antibody titers. I can't remember, but um, maybe not. Anyway, depending on what you're meeting, um, sometimes we'll do antibody titers to see, okay, is this an old response where it was, um, it's high and it's staying high? or it's really high and it's declining and it never goes back up, or you, you'll do a titer where you, you get blood, you see a little response, you recheck it in a month, and now the response is through the roof, well then you can kind of timeline when the actual response or the initial infection. Like for, um, oops, I changed the slide. Like for like it being exposed to a tick or something. Okay, um, there's a couple of other things about humoral immunity that we got to touch on. Um, so there's active and passive humoral immunity. So on this slide, we're going to touch on active human, humoral immunity. So this is when your, your body meets the problem child, meets the antigen, and and responds. So naturally require, acquired is when, you know, you're out and your anatomy and physiology professor tells you to stay out of her office because she doesn't feel good and she's worried it's the flu and she has a doctor's appointment in two hours. So, you know, don't, don't come in her office, but you decide to anyway, and you have a seat and then she sneezes on you or coughs on you. And then boom, you have the flu too. Congratulations. Naturally acquired influenza A. That didn't really happen, but it could have. Okay. And then artificially acquired is when someone has taken a pathogen and they have chemically changed it and injected it into you, but it's okay because it has been changed so that it's not pathogenic, but it still has enough of the proteins that your body can mount an immune response. So your body sees, hey, what the heck is that? That's not supposed to be here. I'm going to grab a hold of that and I'm going to get that activated so that I can make an army. There you go. So um, most vaccines are either attenuated, which means modified live, or completely dead. So rabies vaccines, for example, those are dead. Um, but most of our ex, uh, vaccinations are modified live, so attenuated. They've been changed. Those All those proteins are in there, 
and it mounts a great response so that you have artificially met that vaccine, like hepatitis. Um, you've artificially met the antigen, sorry, and you mount a great response. Okay, passive humoral immunity. That means that you acquire antibodies somehow. You didn't make those antibodies. Those antibodies were given to you. You never met the antigen, so therefore there is no memory cells hanging out. You are physically given somebody else's antibodies. This is how we got through the Ebola virus. And hopefully this is what we can do with the coronavirus. But it's complicated. All of this is very complicated. Again, we're just touching the surface. Okay. Um, so naturally acquired is the reason that it's a great idea for babies to be able to nurse. Um, it's a big deal in cattle. If cattle doesn't don't get that first milk, it's called colostrum. Uh, in all species, it's called colostrum. That calf sure might not make it because cows live in a dirty world. Okay, another way that they we get natural acquired uh, antibodies is just from being inside mom. So mom gives us some of her antibodies as we develop. Artificially acquired, maybe you uh, maybe you decide you're going to go do a, a mission trip. And you're going to go to, oh, I don't know, Haiti or some parts of Africa. And this is an area that you've never been to. And people that live there, they're fine with all those diseases around there. They've, they've grown up with all those diseases. But we've never met those diseases in our life. You're going to get a great big slam of gamma globulin. So gamma globulin is a type of antibody to help defend you. It is temporary. It is not for forever. So let's say you, you went on your little mission trip and 10 years later somebody says, hey, you know what? We did some good. Let's go do that again. 10 years, too long. You're going to get another great big slam of IgG, of immunoglobulin G, to help protect you. And again, those, those proteins, the antibodies, they're going to degrade. And so uh, it's, a, it's a passive thing. It gets you through those couple of months, three months that you're there, but uh, it will fade away. So this is kind of a nutshell thing right here, a summary where humoral immunity, it's active. So you've met the antigen and there's two ways that can be. You actually met it like the flu because somebody sneezed on you or coughed on you or you got a vaccine and you create your own antibodies. Passive. This is when you get antibodies from somebody else. If it's natural, that would be usually like a fetus or an infant getting it from mom. Artificial would be you get an injection of antibodies. Another name for an antibody is an immunoglobulin. So again, antibodies are made by plasma cells. Um, when we talked about uh, in the... In the blood, you have total protein. We had albumin, and then we had uh, gamma globulins that we mentioned. So it's this, these are them. Gamma globulins are the antibodies. Oh, don't know that I really want to get into the shape of an antibody. Okay. Um, so some people will use a couple of different ways to remember this. I use GAMED, G-A-M-E-D, um, but some people use MADGE. It doesn't matter. Um, but these are different kinds of antibodies. Um, some of them are found in different areas. Some of them are more potent than others. So IgM, notice I have the things in bold that you need to know. IgM, that's the first antibody relief released, okay? Um, IgA is found like in our nose, our mucoid secretions, and his job is to prevent a pathogen from getting past point A. Um, I'm going to skip over IgD. Um, he is going to be, he's blind. He's on the B cells. IgG though, the majority of our antibodies that are floating around in our body in our plasma are IgG. So they're going to be long-lived. 
they came usually from the secondary response. Um, they can cross the placental barrier. So there, there you go. Those are some of the passively artificially acquired antibodies. And then AG, IgE is going to show up with allergies. You can do IgE testing even. Um, and this is this protein, so immunoglobulin E, he actually can cause mast cells to release um, their histamine or basophils. Mast cells are the big guys that are showing out in the tissues, and they're going to be the first responders to a cut or to a bee sting or whatever. Um, so some plasma cells, many of them actually can change from making, let's say, IgG to IgA. Um, they can do lots of different things. Um, but initially, that first response, like, so like the slide before said, IgM is first. But then he can switch to IgG. And the reason that most of our, the 85% of our plasma protein antibodies are IgG, IgG is because it's the secondary response, and that's the guy that's long-lived. Again, antibodies don't, don't kill the bad guy. They just grab a hold of it, and they mark it for destruction. Sometimes they um, can wrap themselves all around it, and um, then that antigen can't bind to anything. So essentially he has inactivated it because they've covered up all the binding sites of the bad guy. But there's different ways that uh, antibodies can um, do their job. So these are the different names, neutralization, agglutination, you've met that one before, precipitation and complement fixing. So uh, neutralization, they're going to go and prevent that guy from binding to anything. This is actually quite common. Um, so they're going to completely go, they're going to surround themselves around that antigen and cover up all the binding sites. So he physically, the bad guy, the antigen, physically cannot bind himself to your own cells. Then what's going to happen is the body sees that as, oh, hey, look at that. There's an antigen and the antibody tied up together. I'm going to eat it. Um, agglutination is a very similar type situation. Um, and you can see that in, uh, you give somebody with type A blood, type B blood. And it's a, they're going to link up. It's not necessarily a full surrounding. It's a whole bunch of them are going to be linked together. A whole bunch of antibody antigen complexes are just linked together in a chain. Um, I don't know where my precipitation thing is. Here it is. Okay. Um, precipitation is um, we're going to have some unattached antigens and antibodies bind to it and then they kind of fall out of solution like they're heavy. And then that allows phagocytes to uh, get a hold of them because they're just sinking to the bottoms of that tissue or sinking to the bottoms of the vessels. They get recognized as a problem. Okay, and then finally, I mentioned that complement, he can do his job uh, in, the, in the innate system. He knows that that's what he's supposed to do. But sometimes what will end up happening is a B cell will present to complement. And then uh, the complement actually will poke a hole in it and break the cell because the B cell says, look what I got. Picture. So in the end, um, the antibodies have different ways of making sure that um, these antigens don't invade the body, but they do not kill. They will allow for maybe a macrophage to come and eat it, or maybe create some sort of inflammatory response, which is in the end going to bring in 
more invaders to to kill that guy, like a neutrophil. Or we're going to have some compliment come along and poke a hole in it and compliment. But compliment got the info because of the antibody, because of the B cell. So compliment pokes a hole in it and destroys it. Um, so there you go. In a, in a summary, <laughs> B cells make plasma cells. Their army are called plasma cells. The plasma cells spit out a whole bunch of antigen that can float around. B cells have antigens that are, I mean, an, antigen um, recognizers, antigen uh, determinants on them that are fixed on them. But when they create an army of plasma cells, they just spit them out. They're going after things that haven't made into that cell yet. So just, that's why it's humoral immunity. It's in the fluid. It's not actually inside the cell. And that video, I'm kind of wondering if that's Hank again. Okay.